so I, I'm Julia Potts. I'm, I'm part of the UK leadership team uh, for the Ambassador Theatre Group. Um, I have particular responsibility for seven large regional theatres uh, in the cities of Edinburgh, Glasgow, Sunderland, Liverpool, Bristol and Milton Keynes. Um, so that, that is a perspective that I hope to bring to this conversation. Um, I previously worked in the subsidised theatre sector and I spent the first 10 years of my career working in theatre education and community work. So thank you very much indeed for inviting me uh, to be part of this morning's conversation. Um, the Ambassador Theatre Group, um, for those who are not familiar with us, is a commercial company which operates 10 theatres in London's West End and 24 theatres across the UK, including three venues in Scotland, but none yet in Wales or Northern Ireland. We also operate venues in Germany and the USA and have a production arm across all three territories. Consequently, I'm here to provide an overview into not only our business, but I hope I might provide some insight into a big picture view across the country. So the impact of COVID-19 on our organisation. ATG closed all of its UK theatres on the night of Monday the 16th of March. With almost no public funding, although I must note the honourable exception of some local authority contracts in the regions, our revenue, which stems primarily from ticket sales and ancillary food and beverage sales, also disappeared overnight. Of our 4,000 plus workforce in the UK, currently around 200 people are still working and not on furlough. Our leadership team's immediate focus was on the protection of jobs, and that has remained the key priority. The job retention scheme has provided a vital lifeline to us as to many others and has genuinely helped individuals cope with the sudden and complete cessation of their work. However, in spite of support from our investors, the prolonged nature of this pandemic means that we are having to make very difficult decisions about our staff base and our operating model. Some of you may have read recent articles suggesting that ATG has been in receipt of significant investment from our owners. I would simply note that the reality is that without any revenue, such support for a business of our scale only lasts so long, and investment decisions will ultimately always be based on economics. I think it's important to share with the panel the impact of COVID-19 on the mental health and well-being of our staff. With a staff cohort of some 4,000 employees with whom we have stayed in frequent contact, including carrying out regular surveys, we have a substantial insight into the well-being of the industry workforce. The prolonged uncertainty about the industry's future, the personal financial impact, the effect of being furloughed or indeed of remaining in a vastly reduced working group, the large numbers of people in our organisation whose partner also works in the sector, those who live alone and for whom work was their life, all of these things have produced a unique and horrible combination of circumstance which has had a huge and devastating impact on people's mental health and well-being. Providing some certainty and a clear plan for the future is paramount for individuals as well as for organisations. The most positive government intervention thus far from our perspective has without doubt been the job retention scheme, not least because it was available to all organisations and therefore in the language of our sector treated both the subsidised and commercial halves equally. It is perhaps worth taking a moment at this juncture to reiterate the point that the theatre sector is an ecology with each component organism deeply connected to or reliant upon many others. If you remove one, it collapses. Therefore, the democratic nature of the JRS has worked well for us, protecting jobs across a wide range of organisations, all of which are awesome. Which leads me on to what the future might look like. The recent announcement of the 1.5 billion rescue package was without doubt an extraordinary and welcome moment. Of course, we don't yet know how or when it will be distributed. Naturally, ATG would not expect an organisation like ours to be top of the list. But without an opening date, our highest priority remains the protection of jobs. And we fail to see how this can be achieved without financial support to bridge the gap between the end of JRS and the time when our theatres are relit. So the need for support for employees of organisations which are unable to trade and generate revenue as normal remains exactly the same as it was in March. And in our sector, this presents the challenge that those with subsidy may be able to save jobs, whereas those without may not. 
I would hope this is not the case and that all parts of the ecology are given due consideration, but it is something I would like to draw to the panel's attention. It is my personal experience that there can be a lack of understanding in the sector as to how a company like ATG is structured, and this may lead to false conclusions being drawn. And the truth is, if you live in Sunderland, for example, you probably don't care very much who is running your theatre or what type of organisation they are. What you care about is that your much-loved theatre is well cared for, presents the highest quality and best range of shows, and employs people reliably and happily from your city and region. It's important that this is remembered as we move into the decision-making phase. We have already spoken about the importance of a date for reopening, and I must underline that once again. But what is also of vital importance to ATG and to the sector as a whole, and will be for some time to come, is that producers are able to derive real and practical support from the fund or elsewhere. Without commercial producers creating shows and touring them, we will not be able to reopen our theatres. Much of the industry simply will not be able to mobilise when required. They're vital and must not be overlooked. And as we all know, the art of producing is all about understanding and being prepared to take risk. That is something that is going to be very difficult to do in this climate without some kind of additional help. Ideally, this might take the form of underwriting insurance, but it could also be in the form of investment partnerships on commercial terms with government or arm's length bodies such as the Arts Council. Both of these would, we believe, give producers greater confidence to return. Producers are also the primary employers in the commercial sector of the many thousands of freelance professionals who work in our sector and whose skills range from acting to a vast range of technical specialisms such as sound design, lighting and set building, to casting and stage management. It has been well documented that a high percentage of theatre freelancers have been missed by existing schemes of support. So it is our view, as a theatre operator that relies on producers, and by extension these teams of skilled freelancers to put the work on in our theatres, that they must be a priority for help in the next phase. Lastly, I want to touch on the critical role of local authorities. We work in very successful and positive partnership with a number of key local authorities across the country, and we are well aware of the struggles they too are facing after a decade of funding cuts, and now the additional pressure of COVID-19. It is paramount for many regional theatres that their local authority does not abandon them at this moment, and that support for culture remains on the agenda. Regional theatres in particular play a critical role in their local community's identity, history and storytelling. They may be closed, but they're going to be needed more than ever as we begin to re rebuild our places and our communities. Without the substantial tranche of funding, care and investment that comes from local government and regional leadership, many will find it hard to survive beyond reopening. We need central government to understand this and offer support to local government alongside packages of industry-specific support. And those of us who manage theatres should ensure we remain in conversation with them as much as we are with central government and offer whatever support we can to help deliver local agendas post COVID-19. And when we do finally reopen, we hope that there can be a national marketing and communications campaign, which celebrates all that is wonderful in all theatres across the country, which gives audiences confidence in coming together once again, and we can approach together in a spirit of industry solidarity and hope for the future. It would be good if this moment of an industry crisis has the effect of ultimately bringing us closer together, improving understanding of one another's ways of working, and engendering greater respect for the part each organisation and individual plays in creating this living, breathing thing called theatre. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much.